AMS Translators, we are here live at MS Milan 2023. We've just ended day one of the three-day conference. Hopefully you all know me by now, Brett Drummond, co-founder of MS Translate. I am here with... Travis Stiles. CEO of Novron Bioscience and longtime friend and collaborator with MS Translate. So as we always do, at these conferences, we're going to give you a small summary of some of the research that we heard about today that we found interesting. As always, uh, if you do have any questions about anything that we say in the video, feel free to drop them in the comments below and we'll make sure that we answer them as soon as possible. As well as that, you can go onto the Ectrum's website and look at the conference program if you want to look ahead to the sessions that are coming up over day two and day three and give uh, ideas for sessions that you want us to talk about, feel free to do that as well and we will do our best to attend those sessions. So it's been a really busy day, day one. I know that you went to a, a few different sessions. Uh, I've been to a few different sessions. We're also joined here by Dr. Joanna Cobbin, who you will probably see on future videos across um, the rest of the conference. So we've done our best between the three of us to attend as many different sessions as we can. As you may remember from previous videos, the way that this conference works is that there are nine sessions running concurrently, which means that we cannot get to all of them, but we do our best to go through as many as possible. So Travis, why don't we throw to you? Um, I know that you went to some sessions today that, that I didn't sit in. So why don't you give us some insights that you learned today that might be interesting both to our audience and, and to me. Yeah, so the, the first session I went to today was um, uh, largely on the myelin plasticity. Um, and unfortunately, I was a little bit late because this is a massive venue and I underestimated how long it would take me to get there. Um, but I, w I found the, one of the talks there really interesting in the sense that there was work done and I, and I am blanking on the, the, uh, pr the presenter's name. Um, where they were looking at uh, this gene, uh, RMAC1, and they, there was the hypothesis that there would be like uh, changes in myelination based on, 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 on like kind of the previous data and some of the phenotypes that they had seen in cell culture. And they, I thought it was really interesting because um, while they did see some myelin changes, the most profound phenotype that they noticed was like this really, really substantial change in the sleep architect architecture of the animals. Um, which was totally unanticipated. And because sleep disturbance is like a really big deal with the MS patient population, it, I, I think it was a really potential, one of those kind of, you know, could be the beginning of one of those cool like serendipitous discoveries to kind of help us better understand the sleep disturbances in that disease. Um, you know, it, it didn't really play into what I went there to go see, but it was one of those things where, you know, you really picked up on the excitement um, from the presenter that, you know, a lot of times in science, it's the unanticipated findings that, that lead to the kind of coolest results. And uh, it was weird because, you know, uh, like rodent, rodent, in rodent models, they have kind of like a very clear circadian cycle. And uh, to see that that cycle almost completely disrupted spontaneously from this genetic kind of uh, modification, um, I think was really interesting. Okay. And that's, I mean, there's been some studies recently that have shown sleep disturbances independently impact on fatigue mm -hmm. in people living with MS. We know that fatigue is one of the most commonly reported symptoms and also the symptom that has the biggest impact on quality of life. Um, so there's been a lot of talk around, you know, if we can target therapies to treat sleep disturbances, that's going to have benefits for fatigue. So I guess understanding potential causes of some of these sleep disturbances may lead to targeted therapies that could have quite a big impact for people living with MS. Well, and I'll, and I'll say, you know, obviously if you're having disordered sleep, sleeping more is probably helpful for fatigue. But I think what was interesting about these studies is they directly linked the disordered sleeping into uh, diminished outcomes in terms of spontaneous remyelination as well. So they actually showed uh, like a, a pretty, pretty robust pathological hallmark um, that was, you know, because I believe this was in a non, uh, like it wasn't a neuronal cell, it wasn't a glial cell, I believe it was just in, in the, I mean, it, it was micro, uh, microglia, so, but not an astrocyte or a myelinating cell. Um, 
and, and the, you know the the end phenotype they actually did show that the, the 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 kind of like pervasiveness of lesions and the lack of spontaneous recovery um you know was directly related to sleep so as much as i think that it's obviously you know fatigue is a major quality of life problem in the, the ms uh, community uh i i think that where this was really interesting to me was that they're not necessarily uncoupled. The, the actual dis underlying disease pathology and the disordered sleep looks like they might actually be more tightly okay. connected than we thought. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm gonna throw it to you again for your second session because the second session that you went to randomly, I was standing outside it when you exited and you almost ran at me and yelled at me that that session was excellent. Yep. Um, so what did you hear in that session that got you so excited? You know, there was a couple things. So one, I think we last year, we saw a lot of the same old, the same same faces that you see in a lot of MS conferences, and uh, it was interesting because uh, you know there was two very similar um, uh, kind of uh, seminars or the symposia that were going on, and I took the one that was that was not the young investigator one, uh, and I was really kind of impressed because there was a couple of young investigators even in this session, and I think that was somewhat missing in last year's conference is that a lot of the big sessions lacked some fresh faces or some younger ideas and uh in this particular one it was a lot about you know the, the title was so long and I'm, i but it, it was basically all about macrophages and microglia and um i personally am very interested in the kind of like the phenotypes of these you know kind of sentinel cells and their kind of like their their response to the kind of environment, their ability to kind of clear debris, their phagocytic state, um, and how that affects disease. And the there was a lot of really cool stuff and a lot of stuff that I had not heard in the past correlating different different kind of phenotypes or or you know uh, phagocytic state is such a boring term, but the, the, these cells can be primed in different ways to be reparative or you know it's almost like they can be primed to come in and sweep the floors versus you know you know build a new wall like they 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 can they can clean up they can tear down they can they can build and there was, was some really interesting and cool findings about kind of like the microenvironment influence on these cells and how tweaking one way or another could really change the profile of how these cells behaved and also capturing in a moment in time specific versions of this and being able to correlate very well to longer term prognosis. Yeah. Um, one of the talks that I actually thought was really interesting is kind of this very clear characterization of the different kind of lesion phenotypes and kind of looking at the thickness of the perilesional rim of the, of, the, of the monocytes in the area and being able to kind of show that like if you were able to see this at these different times that that was a, that that was largely associated with a much more rapid disease phenotype um, and I think that you know it's really difficult to, to wrap up. It was a very exciting, you know, uh, 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 kind of like group of talks. But I think that relationship between kind of the activation state, the debris clearance profile, both in terms of like the speed and the extent of engulfment of, of kind of debris in the area, and then the persistence as opposed to motility. Like, are they staying in the same spot? Are they navigating through the lesion? Are, are, they, are they moving around or are they kind of stuck? Are they, are they, are they engorged in fat because they've over, overeaten or are they really metabolically active? I think that those types of things are, you know, I think it's kind of like the next frontier of being able to understand the you know the, the lesion kind of phenomenon uh, in MS and so that we can kind of better in, in at least in my mind I think we can potentially be thinking about more more direct kind of therapeutic interventions in these active or 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 inactive lesions to kind of lead to better patient outcomes. Well, and also I mean we know that these cells clearing myelin debris is important for remyelination to work effectively. And so I, I guess from an overall perspective, yeah. we're looking at myelin repair and trying to develop therapies and we, and we constantly talk about this being the next big thing. Mm -hmm. We've got effective therapies now to try and halt new disease from occurring, but we don't have anything that can effectively repair damage. Yeah. Part of that is being able to clear. We know that if this debris doesn't get cleared, that really impacts on that. So understanding how these cells are behaving is really important you know we, we sort of look at that you know it's really interesting when you're sitting in these sessions and you can look at all of this data in a very focused sort of way and that's how it's presented but i think we're in a lucky sort of space with what we're doing here that we can also come and think about that in the big picture mm -hmm. of lots of other stuff and put this together 
Um, so I understand your excitement coming out of this in terms of hearing all of that sort yeah. of stuff. I, you know, last year I got really excited when I saw the Hendricks presentation. Yeah. Um, you know, he kind of turned a lot of things on his head, on the head when it's like you said, like the dog when the field has been clean up the debris faster, 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 faster. And he kind of, he was kind of the first person I've ever heard say, no, if you slow it down, if you pace the cells, you might get better outcomes. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of data to back it up and I was really good. tortoise and hay. Yeah, pretty much. Philosophy. And the, the thing is, is I, I came out of that talk a year ago being kind of really excited about that idea, but it's almost like, it's almost like putting together a puzzle, but somebody spilled all the puzzle pieces in the couch cushions. Yep. And so you've got like the, the, the scattered mess, but every once in a while you'll find a new piece in the couch and it just gets exciting because you're, you're, you're making, you're getting close to the bigger picture. Yep. And I think there was components of today's talk that I love the idea of unifying hypotheses when things kind of don't make sense and somebody gives you a new piece of information that reconciles two potentially not, not reconcilable kind of ideas. There was a lot of things today in terms of not looking at it as binary, but on a spectrum of like how activated and how much of the debris these cells are eating versus how much they're in a reparative or or a non phagocytic state. And I think that there was there was some pieces in there that really seemed to indicate that there's a sweet spot because if the cells are going too overboard in terms of eating as rapidly as they can, they become stuck, they become stagnant, they become foamy, and the lead in the persistence of that perilesional rim, I think, makes it almost impossible, you know, for the the system to kind of resolve that chronic inflammation and, 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 and get things back to kind of a homeostatic state. Yeah. And so, you know, it was, it, I'm going to be reading a lot of papers from the, coming out of that talk. I was actually like writing frantically every time they throw a paper up because I wanted to read more. But I think that there, I think that there was a good handful of puzzle pieces that got pulled out of the couch cushion in that, in that presentation. So I, that, I'm always excited for that stuff. Okay, fantastic. Now, if you want Travis to do a video for every paper that he reads, please do comment below and make sure that you ask him to do that and we'll make him do that. That'd be a great way to alienate your viewers. Free time is certainly something that Travis has a lot of, so I'll be happy to pressure him to do that if you, enough of you comment saying that you want those videos. I think one of the things you mentioned there about young researchers ties in nicely with one of the comments we got in the plenary. So we had the keynote speaker today was Professor Stephen Hauser from University of California, San Francisco, um, who gave a really wide ranging lecture, really looking at his involvement um, in MS research now spanning over 40 years yeah. um, and one of his comments towards the end was it's been really exciting for him being in the generation that's made a lot of advancements but he thinks the next generation of scientists coming through the times are even more exciting because of the sorts of things that we're now being able to do. Um, we won't go into everything that he talked about but I thought there were some really key points that he made throughout that that sort of hammered home a few things that we know at the moment. One that I think came out really clearly was there's now, I would say, not an argument anymore. People would probably disagree with that because there is always some contradiction around this, but I think there's almost a consensus now around the fact that getting people onto highly effective therapies earlier leads to better long-term outcomes. Um, and he showed some really interesting data on that, that that proved it quite convincingly and that, you know, even the, the delays in getting people in the gap that widens in terms of disability accrual never really get brought back no. once you find them on. So that the sooner we can, we can get people on, um, the better. Um, did you have takeaways from, the, from that lecture? I mean, he, like you said, he, he really touched on a lot of things, but I think one of the things that came out of that particular comment, I think was echoed or at least reinforced by some, by some other talks I saw today, where, you know, that delay in, in kind of like initiating effective therapy can really have pretty profound, you know, uh, you know long-term consequences. But not just that, it's also if you have disruptions in care disruptions in care you 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 almost like really sabotage the long-term effect of what of, of what was working yep. you know you it's not just that you lose a little bit it actually compromises the long-term effect efficacy the slope of the effect that you were getting all along yep. um and i think you know being from the states where a lot of times continuity of care can be really problematic just because of the crazy healthcare system that we have uh that really that, that really resonated with me that like you know, a lot of times you think that like, oh, obviously if you stop taking your medicine for a while, you're gonna, re you're gonna kind of like fall off. But if you start taking it again, you're, you'll be back, you'll be fine again. Yeah. And seeing that that's absolutely not true, 
that the consequences are, you know, kind of compounding and 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 and, and devastating potentially. Um, I think that that's something that, you know, you know, a lot of times you and I talk, you know, off camera about the things that you, you can kind of empower your audience for. Like, what are the things that they can put their passion and their energy towards? And I think that's that's a kind of message that you could really that I think is really important for you know uh, uh, you know people that kind of you know, that are part of the advocate or the patient community to kind of really be aware of is continuity and, and, and you know, consistency in your care uh, is pretty profoundly important, yeah. even beyond what you would think kind of just from a common sense standpoint. Yeah, and I think that ties in with, with another thing that he mentioned, which is really a, a newer sort of concept in MS, and he really walked through the history of how we've changed our understanding, but sort of the, the fact that there was always these three, he called it the three acts uh, of MS, mm -hmm. where we have what happens essentially before diagnosis in this, this programming phase. We then have this period of inflammation, which we've traditionally called, you know, the relapsing remitting MS part. And then we have the neurodegeneration happening more at what we would have called progressive MS. But really now we have an understanding that those things are overlapping. Oh yeah. That, that neurodegeneration is there from the start and this is a concept that we heard a lot about today as well called mm -hmm. PIRA. We won't go into it too much. We've heard, we've talked about PIRA before on MS Translate, but progression independent of relapse activity, basically that regardless of, of what's going on, there is always a little bit of deterioration and disability accrual, accrual happening in the background. Um, so yeah, some really interesting stuff. I think the last point that he made really early in the talk, which I was really interested to hear because it, is, because it is not the sort of thing that you hear scientists say very often because by nature we are very hesitant to make claims and we always down talk everything. Yep. Uh, but he said he believes MS is curable. Now he did say that we need to think about how we define the word cure and, mm -hmm. and how he defines it may be different to, to some other people, but I thought that was really obviously very positive to hear yep. um, that, you know, that people who have been in this field for a really long time and now thinking about this um, as something that is a, a curable disease. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think, you know, when you think about the diseases that are incurable or like, I, I often get frustrated when people are like, we're going to cure cancer. Cancer, if you live to be a thousand, if we fix everything else, cancer will still be a thing. Alzheimer's, you know, to an extent is still a similar thing. But yeah, I mean, MS is clearly a, a things are, things have gone off track. And I think that there, if you can get them back on track, you can stop the disease. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we've got a ways to go to get there. And like, yeah, it very much like you, the, the defining what a cure means, I think is very important. But uh, I think the pieces that we pulled together so far, clear, it, and also, I mean, just, just the evidence we see with, with responders to HSCT and how profound that can be. Like, is it a cure? I mean, there's, the, you, you'll, you can get you know, relapses and, 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 and kind of rebound effects, but the fact that you can, you can there's many people where you can actually pull the plug on the disease for a while yeah. is, I think, just one piece of evidence of where, what the potential actually yeah. can be. Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually had, just to, to finish, because before we started this, I said to Travis, let's try and keep this brief. That was always going to be optimistic. We were never going to be able to do that. Um, and I take full responsibility. It's definitely me that's, that's very, talked a lot. That's very, yeah, that's very kind of you. Yeah. But if you're interested in hearing more from Professor Hauser, I was lucky enough to uh, record a podcast interview with him. It went for around 25 minutes. We had a great chat. It's available on the Ekrams podcast, which you can subscribe to on all podcast platforms. I do um, really encourage you to go and listen to that. Uh, cause he if you're not subscribed, clearly. go subscribe. It's excellent, he does an excellent job. And he talks really clearly about his journey and shares a lot of really interesting insights in that that I think will be really beneficial for the community. So with that being said, thank you very much for listening to this video. As I said, comment below with all of your thoughts and questions. We will be back tomorrow with our day two summary. Lots more to hear, uh, but thank you for listening and we look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Thanks everyone.